Welcome back to What You'll Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today we are doing a fantastic book, The Life You Can Save, How to Play Your Part in Ending World Poverty. It's certainly not our regular book, but it's one that I think everyone should uh, read and understand. Yeah, mate. It's a bit of a. It's one of those books that's a, a, a bit of a punch in the face. Definitely. And it probably will change the way you look at, I know, the way you consume things and maybe there's better ways of spending your money and, you, you know... By the end of this book, you realize that you can actually save someone's life on the other side of the world. Significant impact. Mate, so the first story that he starts the book off, a dude named Wesley Autry, and he was standing on the, the train station. He saw a dude stumble and fall on the tracks. So there's a train coming, and Wesley jumps in, pushes him down and lies on top of him and like holds him down so that the train goes over the top of both of them. Mate, it's a pretty dangerous thing to do. Yeah. And so anyway, when the, the TV guys interviewed this Wesley, he just said, you know, I didn't feel like I did anything spectacular. I saw someone who needed help and I just did what feels right. Mm. And so Singer says, you know what? We can save a life as well and in fact, many lives by just doing small things that actually don't have a big impact on our daily life but can significantly change someone else's. Yeah, and it's absolutely huge, man. Saving a life, you know, you can't downplay mm. what it is. And he says, if, you, if you're sitting there and if you're listening to this or if you're reading his book and you've got a can of soda or if you had your yeah. $4 latte, you probably got, even. Yeah, you've probably got the discretionary money that actually you can start probably pointing toward in the direction of yeah. saving someone's life. If and, you think, oh, I don't have enough aid. money to give away, but then you've just gone twice a week, you're buying a $4 bottle of water instead of getting it out of the tap for free, mm. you've got some money that you can give. Yeah. yeah, mate. So the purpose of the book, it's not to to make you feel guilty, which you, <laughs> you probably do reading it, but it's to reduce the extreme poverty in the world. Yeah. So a few facts he's got here. 18 million people are dying unnecessarily each year. This is actually the higher, higher than the death rate of World War II. Mm. And in the past 20 years alone, it adds to more deaths that were caused by all the civil and, and international wars of the 20th century. So the century Jesus. of Hitler and Stalin, there's more people dying due to poverty in, by, by a huge margin. Well, that's crazy, man. On the positive side, he says that in 1960, there were 20 million child deaths, so under five years old. In 2007, whilst the population doubled, that number halved to less than 10 million. But... He says that's 9.7 million children every single year. Most of those are preventable yep. with a little bit of help. So Singer says that, I believe if you read this book to the end and look honestly and carefully at our situation, you'll agree that we must act. Yeah, and it's one of those things is like, how much would you do to prevent, say, the horrors of like another Hitler coming through or something? But at the same time, how little do we do to prevent today's even larger toll exactly. of these issues? So it's something we kind of turn a blind eye to and, and, and a little bit willfully ignorant. So part, chap- yeah, sorry, man. Part one is the argument, and chapter one is saving a child. Mate, hit us with the drowning toddler. Yeah, so he has the, uh, a lot of thought experiments um, from the book, but this one is if you're going on the way to work and you've got this new, new lovely shoes and your new suit or whatever, but on the way you see some kid splashing in a pond, but as you get closer, you see the, the kid's actually drowning, you know, and he's, he's gasping for air. And what would you do, he says? So if the child is unable to keep his head above the water, would you go in and ruin your shoes and pull him out or would you keep keep going to work and making sure you're not too late? Exactly, man. And that's a that's the trade-off is the new shoes and dirty suit pants and you might be a bit late to work. Mm. Is that payoff? Is, is it worth paying that in order to save this toddler's life? Yeah, and most people when you get asked, of course you're going to run in and yeah. save the toddler's life. But really on the macro level of what's happening around the world is actually... Definitely not what's happening because essentially that kid who's drowning in this thought experiment, he's happening every single day. Mm. So every year, 10 million people under five are dying due to um, preventable causes of, of poverty. So as we're going to our work on our day-to-day grind in an indirect way, we're doing pretty much the same thing. Exactly, man. And that's the... Whilst uh, we'll get into why that specific, you know, walking past a kid drowning is uh, a much harder thing to do than just not giving aid to preventable diseases, and we'll get into that a bit, bit later. But that's the thing, man. That we got to, we we can make that conscious decision of shoes versus a kid's life, but it's sometimes harder to make these other things, which we'll try and help throughout the book. Yep. Yeah, so you know, rather than putting money to an aid agency, we we. We probably everyone listening to this in your developed country, you know, you spend a lot of money on concerts, going out for some beers, having yep. a palmer on, on the weekends yeah. and, and so <laughs> forth. Mate, he, he takes a look at poverty today and the World Bank defines extreme poverty as not having enough income to meet the most basic human needs for food, water, shelter, clothing, sanitation, healthcare and education. Yep. And the the poverty line, I guess, is a dollar twenty five in the US. Yep. Uh, and so that's sort of the poverty line. He says that there's one point four billion people living 
below the poverty line in the world today. Mate, and the biggest thing about that is, I think, it, that is factored in for purchasing power. So people who've travelled mm. the world might think, you know, dollar twenty five can get you pretty far in Asia. Yeah. But that's adjusted for purchasing power. So it's like living off a dollar twenty five if you're from the US. Yeah. So it's what you could buy with a dollar twenty five in the US mm. today. It's not taking a dollar twenty five overseas. And- yeah living like a king and it's very relative so poverty in wealthy societies in, yeah. if you're in a developed country you might feel poor because you know there's all these good things coming yeah. on advertised on, on TV, tv and they're beyond your budget but in usa 97 percent of people are classified as poor but the ones sorry the ones who are classified as poor own a color tv yeah yeah so 97 percent of people classified as poor own a tv and he says three quarters of the people classified as poor own a car Three quarters have air conditioning, three quarters have a DVD player, and 100% have access to healthcare. Yeah, so that's in a developed country, but on the other that's end of the yeah, developed country, that's, that's you've a got, poor person in a developed country. Then the rich people, man. Yeah. <laughs> you got, uh, there's something called the 787 Boeing Dreamliner, which costs $150 <laughs> million. There are a lot of people around the world drive around. Um, comedian Lewis Black, some dude, he, he, he's got a pretty funny gag. He says, it's the only way they can achieve their life's goal of flying over every single starving person on earth and yelling, hey, look what I'm spending my money on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Man, it's not, a, not a funny gag. But, um, yeah, Man, another, sh- another example is one uh, a billionaire dude who spent $20 million to fly to space. Yes. Like, um, and just things like that, that, that $20 million could go pretty far. Man, I saw a lecture when I was at Monash University. There was Alan Finkel. I think he's one of the chief scientists of Australia. The same thing, he spent $10 million on getting eight seconds in air, in, in space. Jesus. It's like, mate, you're better off. <laughs> that's crazy. I can think of a lot of other good things you can find eight seconds from. And that's a super rich. But also when he talks about other affluence today, which is uh, the affluence of people listening to this, he says you can get your recommended eight glasses of water for a few cents every day or you can buy a bottle of water like the Jones man <laughs> <laughs> just drinking out of bottle of water which he paid three bucks Mate, for. as you said that <laughs> I was just taking a sip of this water could have oh it. Jesus but he says that we're <laughs> in 2006 uh, we bought 31 million litres of bottled water that's, yep. a, that's a shitload of bottled water that we could have just got out of the tap yeah so you can't really shake your head at the super rich you got bottled yeah. waters and lattes <laughs> you know we're probably all in the same boat man he says that the average woman owns $600 worth of clothes that she hasn't worn in the past year I think that's low ball as well yeah I'd say yeah I'd say there's a lot of girls out there with a, you know, a lot of shoes yeah. just sitting there <laughs> and blokes or uh, and not some, so much some not blokes so, much. so yeah chapter 2 man so that's that's what he puts it out there and there's you know a lot of people thinking for whatever reason, you might think, you know, you don't have to, to give. But he's got this basic argument, which at the end says it's actually wrong not to give money to aid agencies. Yeah. Now, the okay, so we have that drowning child idea. And he said, okay, what about if you're a, a guy, you know, a 60-year-old um, man or woman, you're saving for retirement, you know, you've, you've banked up a couple hundred K, and you know what? You've gone out and bought this new car, which is essentially part of your retirement savings. You want to, you know, you've worked hard. You want to enjoy your retirement. You park it next to the train tracks, and you see a kid playing on the tracks. There's a train coming. Now the kid hasn't seen the train yet. You've got a couple of options. One is to do nothing and take the risk. One is to divert the train, which would end up hitting your car. And so he's saying that okay, before it was a pair of shoes, now it's a car. And you've also got this uncertainty that, okay, if I don't do anything, the kid might still hear the train and get it away in time anyway. So he's sort of saying that this, we've got this uncertainty that if we do nothing, maybe they'll be okay. Maybe if we do something, we're giving up a lot of our, sacrificing a lot from ourselves. It's sort of like that next level of the kid drowning in the pond. But he gives this really basic argument, essentially, with a couple of premises as to why we should give. Yeah. So the first premise is that suffering and death from the lack of food are bad. That's so I think I'd, I'd, say, I'd agree. We'll all agree, I'd agree on that. Yeah. The second premise, which is the, the level two, if it is in your power to prevent something bad from happening without sacrificing anything nearly as important, it is wrong not to do so. I'd agree. If you can do something to save suffering or save death, and it doesn't cost you suffering or death, you should do it. Yeah, or I'd agree. not even co- doesn't cost you much. Yeah. You know, I'd it agree. doesn't cost you a great deal and it won't impact your life. Yeah. The third premise. By donating to aid, aid agencies, you can prevent suffering and death from the lack of food, shelter, and medical care without sacrificing anything nearly as important. So he's saying that essentially tying number one and two, by, by giving to aid agencies, you're not sacrificing anything near as important and you're stopping suffering and death. So if you agree with one, two, and three, there's only one conclusion you can draw. He's saying that's if you do not donate 
to aid agencies and you're doing something wrong. Yeah, so inaction is actually is is bad. So yeah. you're just sitting there and doing nothing. It's it's you're doing the wrong thing. And that's absolutely huge, man. So you've got to ask yourself if you deny any of these or if you disagree with any of these. You've got to find some kind of flaw in this argument or reasoning. Otherwise, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. And, and that's it. Yeah, there's, there's three things. Suffering and death is bad. Yeah. If you can save it without costing too much, that's a good thing. Mm. Yeah. It's huge, it's man. logical, man. And you'll smash sense. some of the, the objections that have probably gone through your head a bit later. Yeah. But it's one of those things, just because everyone else is not doing it, doesn't make it right. Yeah. You know, and that's probably a theme in a lot of books that the majority, a lot of the times, aren't correct. Just because everyone's doing it doesn't mean there's some reason yeah. or logic behind it. It could be <laughs> exactly, stupid yeah. and everyone could be wrong, which they are. Exactly. <laughs> Mate, so chapter three was all about busting objections. He's got eight or ten different objections. We'll pick a few of the bigger ones. Yeah. Yeah. And this is big because I remember, for me personally, man, about five, probably ten years ago when I wrote it in my little diary when I was young, I wrote, I was big on this kind of stuff and I said, yeah. I'd punch my self in the face 10 years time if I'm not giving significant amounts of age agencies, yep. which I'm not at the moment. So, mate, are you going to punch yourself? Yeah. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> so these objections have somehow, you know, crept in my brain. So, these are, yep. these are absolutely huge. So, number one is there is no black and white universal code for everyone. It is better to accept that everyone has a different view on the issue and all people are entitled to follow their own beliefs. So, this is what uh, is known as moral relativism. And I guess you're saying that in, in some cases, it's it could be okay in some cases. It's not so okay. But what he's saying is that many cases we reject moral relativism. So he says that we can and do try to stop people who are cruel to animals, the same as we stop rapists, racists, and terrorists. Mm. So he's saying that there's no room for moral relativism on those issues. Yep. So he's saying if we're rejecting moral relativism there, we should reject it everywhere. Yep, totally. And that's saying that if we can help people, it's not the same level as rapes and terrorism. But yep. it's still... Yeah, so if a rapist is out, if you believe in moral relativism, you're basically saying, you know, the rapist is entitled to his own beliefs and yeah. he's allowed to do that because it's his own point of view and he's free to his own views. Whereas like what Peter Singer is saying, some things are objectively wrong. Yes. And this exactly. is one of them. Exactly. Another one. Okay. If someone wants to buy a new car, they should. If someone wants to redecorate their house or buy a new suit, they should go and get it. They've worked hard for their money and they have the right to spend it on themselves. Yeah. So the problem with this is if you're thinking about fairness, you might consider that you are, you might be a middle class in a developed country and you were fortunate enough to be born in a social and economic circumstances that made it possible for you to live comfortably. Exactly, man. We've got an efficient banking system. We've got a uh, police force and courts for, you know, uh, justice. We've got infrastructure, roads, communication, reliable power yep. supply. We've got and, all these things. Man, I really love the quote here by the Nobel Prize winning scientist Herbert Simon. He says, that social capital is probably responsible for at least ninety percent of the yeah. wealth that you earn. That's massive, ninety percent. Even more. I Buffett think that's said. lowballing, even man. Ninety uh, percent is pretty high. Well, if you, I think you know, if we're all in the top one percent of the world already, yeah. then it's probably more close to ninety nine percent. You know, mm. if you're born in a poor country, you pretty much got no way out. Even Warren Buffett says, if you stuck me in the middle of Bangladesh or Peru, you find out that how much this talent is going to produce in the wrong kind of soil. So even Warren Buffett saying, if he's this guy who can become the best invest investor yep. ever, if he was born in um, one of these uh, impoverished countries, it probably wouldn't have worked out so well. Yeah, the second part of the statement then uh, that you said was that everyone has the right to spend how you wish. Mm. But he says if your mother was sick on a deathbed, you've got the right to spend the weekend surfing, but it's yeah. probably wrong mm. to do so. It's probably not true. what you should, should do. So just because you've got, got a right doesn't mean that you should do it. Very true. Yep. Another one, man, is we already give our fair share through taxes. Isn't that sufficient? Yeah. And what he says that the... Average nation gives 0.46% um, to aid. The US gives 0.18%. The UN target is 0.7%. And one thing they... Okay, so they did a survey and they, and they, they asked people, is the government spending uh, too much, not enough, or about the right amount on um, giving aid? And they said, no, nah, they're, spending, like... <laughs> they're spending too much. And then they said, okay, well, what should they be spending? And they said somewhere between 5 and 10%, but the actual number was 1%. Yeah. So they're saying... They're currently spending too much, but they actually said it should be 5 to 10%. So, and, yeah, and, and we'll soon find out it's a very inefficient 1% yeah, also. Exactly. Another quick one is cash is the seed corn of capitalism. Giving it away will reduce future growth. Mm. So this is the idea that if Warren Buffett gave away his first $1 million, he wouldn't have become a billionaire and gave away $31 billion. Yeah. So he says if you like Warren Buffett, then you're probably better off hanging on to the money until yeah. later in life. But we're probably not all in that category. Yeah. And so is Bill Gates. You know, He's made $60 billion. He's given half of it away. Yep. 
Yeah. So there's a few objections, man. There's some really um, there's a whole bunch of others in the book, and whatever your objections are, I'm sure they get smacked out of the park. Yeah. In that chapter, <laughs> definitely, man. Mate, chapter four was my absolute favorite by far because it ties in a lot of the books we've done and the ideas of you know predictably rational thinking fast and slow influence some of these types of things. Yeah. So it's why we don't give more, and the first reason is the identifiable victim. So a few studies that they did. One group of people received the message, food shortages in Malawi are affecting more than 3 million children. And the second group received a picture of this one girl named Rokia, and she was seven years old. She was looking pretty sad, and it said, her life will be changed for the better by your gift. Mm -hmm. And number two, which has got one single kid, uh, far outstripped number one, which had you know 3 million children. Yeah, and that's a bit of a problem here because it's going to be less efficient spending of money if you just give it to the one kid. You're better off spending mm. it, giving it to a pool of money that does a big pool of projects. So when it's not going directly to a person and you can tell who it is, then it's yeah not as good. Mate, another one they did where they gave a third group, they gave both sets of information, the one person plus the group, and they got in the middle. So they were even getting both amounts of info. They were still less than that single. Yeah. Mate, another one was they said a single child needs life-saving surgery that costs three hundred thousand, and one is saying there's eight children that are going to die unless you, you know, if you can give this three hundred thousand dollar donation, you can save them all. And people were more willing to give the money to save one child, one child, than to save eight. Yep. So that's the idea of futility. So proportion has a big influence. So you're more likely to give if it's if you're going to save eighty percent of a hundred people as opposed yeah. to twenty percent of a thousand. Yeah, exactly. And so, they, they had another one that you know you can say there's this <laughs> refugee crisis. You can save fifteen hundred people out of three thousand at risk, or you can save fifteen hundred out of ten thousand at risk. Yep. And the, it was not it was nothing to do with the number. It was all about the proportion. Yeah. So that's the futility of the whole thing. Another one was pa- I'm going to butcher this word parochialism. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's parochialism. Oh, we'll go with that. <laughs> You're really clever. So he says. Our brains take in when a a big disaster comes in and if it's on the other side of the world and we're Mm. less connected with them, we're less likely to do something about it. So an example here is um, when the tsunami came through Southeast Asia, there's 220,000 people who died and Americans gave 1.5 billion. Mm -hmm. But as soon as Hurricane Katrina came along and it was very close and they could identify with everyone, only six, sorry, when I say only, I'm saying relative to Southeast Asia, 1,600 people were killed. And America pledged six point five billion, so like five times the amount. Five times the amount for what less like one percent, less yeah. than one percent of the deaths. And yeah, another crazy. big puffer man, which you'll hit us with, is diffusion of responsibility. So we've talked about Kitty Genovese. She got stabbed in New York City. Thirty eight people um, stabbed, uh, heard, but did nothing. The other one was there was a, a bystander effect, where if you were a single person in a room, heard someone cry out for help, seventy percent of people went to help. If there were two people in the room and heard the cry for help. Only 7% went out to respond. Yep. So it's that diffusion of responsibility of thinking someone else will do it. Someone else will do it. So, you know, it's probably up to someone else. You you're, you alone aren't very responsible for yeah, it. Exactly. So that's good, man. It's good stuff. Yeah. There was a sick game theory one. A bit yeah. of money stuff, a bit of... A man, few there's, others. There's a few others. I reckon that was the best chapter for me, just yep. of all these crazy things in our brains that trick us into doing the wrong thing, essentially. Yeah, and end up being a selfish little prick. And yes, <laughs> exactly. Buying lattes <laughs> and concerts and so forth. Um, the next chapter was creating a culture of giving. So there's a few things he says here in that uh, number one is getting it out into the open, in that we tend to go off our reference group. So the people, our friends, the people that are most like us, what are they doing? And we go by that lead. If we think none of our friends are giving, we probably think we won't give. Yep. But if, if you're hearing about all your mates are giving a certain percentage of their weekly income, then you think, actually, why aren't I doing that too? Mm. The second step we need to do is put a face on the needy. And that's, the, again, the idea of the identifiable victim. Mm. We need to put a face um, to know where our money is actually going and we're more likely to give. And giving that face turns it more from facts and statistics to emotions. Yeah. And that's why things like uh, World Vision and Plan International, they've got like a sponsor a child program. You give 30 bucks a month and you get like a picture of this little seven-year-old girl and you get like a, every two months you might get a handwritten letter. Even though uh, they don't directly match up one for one, it's all about just putting that face on it. So it's not just a general statistic. Yeah. The third one is this is this idea of opting, opting in and op- versus opting out. Yeah. So... The organ donation rate in Germany is 12% and the rate of organ donation in Austria is 99.98%. Mate, mm. they're right next door to each other. They're pretty much the same country. Yep. Why is it such a massive difference? And one is opt-in in that you have to choose to go on and one is opt-out in that you're 
uh, default settings that you're on and you have to choose to go off. Yeah, mate, I reckon if, if you worked at a, a company and when you first joined the company, they say automatically we give 2% to you know yep. foreign aid and you had to opt out. Yes. Then most people probably wouldn't opt out. They say, oh, yeah, yep. yeah give the way the 2% is probably worth exactly, it. Exactly, man. So there's a book called Nudge by Richard Thaler who won the Nobel Prize uh, last year or the year before, which is phenomenal. We'll do it. Just saying that these, there's such small things that remove some of these barriers and make it so easy to do good stuff. Yeah, and then chapter four is challenging the norm of self-interest. Yeah. So, yeah, just challenging that, selfish pricks. <laughs> yeah. Beating them up. Exactly. No, nah, don't beat them up. <laughs> Chapter six, how much does it cost to save life? So, yeah. Now, tell us about Give Well. Yeah. So, what this, uh, this, this Give Well charity did is they went in and measured the effectiveness of a bunch of charities, basically with the goal of finding out actually how much does it cost to, to actually save a life. Mm. And um, they, they go through it in great detail in the book, but just quickly some of the, the, the costs what it worked out to be. For malaria, it costs between six hundred and two thousand three hundred dollars to save a life. To stop HIV infection-related death, it costs between two hundred and seven hundred dollars. To prevent diarrhea-related deaths, it costs two hundred fifty dollars per life saved. And uh, another one, um, partners in health for health services was about three thousand five hundred dollars per life. And mm. there was another um, organisation, Interplus, was about five hundred fifteen hundred. So basically. All of it ranges between two hundred and two thousand dollars for a life save. So every mate, that's not much, is it? It's not much, to man. Save a life, mate. You could easily save a life every year yeah. by just you know donating oh, exactly, that amount. Man. And so he says that you know, for us sitting here, how can we save a life right now? Basically, there's, he's saying he gives us a few cheap options. One is sending arsenic filters, which is three dollars thirty per family. One is giving good quality cooking stoves, which is about twenty dollars per family, and it means that girls are able to go to school rather than cooking all day. Uh, one is building toilets, which is $22 per home. One is saving eyesight like Fred Hollows, which is $50 per person. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's all these cheap things that we can do that significantly either save lives or improve quality of life. Yeah, and I guess this is just, it probably is another objection. It's this idea that you know if you send your money away, what's, that, what's how effective yeah. is your money really going to be? And there's some other organizations out there one called uh, Charity Navigator, and this focuses attention on the problem. You can find out how much of the money goes to administration, mm. and it's usually about 20% of the revenue of a charity actually goes to admin, and 80% actually goes to, to where it's meant to go. Mm. Exactly, man. Essentially. But yeah. So he says, if you had $450, a spare 450 bucks, there's nothing, it's hard to find something more important than giving a 14 year old a fistula operation. Yeah, these things called obstetric fistulas and so what happens is young girls in these underdeveloped countries you know old seedy old guys get a young wife they're not developed they're not big enough to bear a child and so essentially when they try to give birth the baby gets stuck and it gets stuck there which means not only does the baby die but also the mum gets this tear between either like the wall of the vagina and either bladder or the rectum meaning stuff leaks in that's not meant to leak in essentially yeah and it's such a um unpleasant thing that like the husbands take the wives back and give them back to their family because they stink yeah but he's saying that 450 bucks can just fix that problem and essentially give this woman a second chance yeah and if that person doesn't have this operation can you imagine man being 15 years old yeah. and having that for the rest of your life you exactly. know, no males will go near you yeah and you and in those countries they rely, really rely on, on the male to to provide for them exactly so man. crazy so chapter seven was improving aid and what, so he starts with a you know there was a, a guy telling a story you know the West has given two point three trillion dollars over the past five decades so the West is already generous but seeing it breaks this down two point three trillion that's forty six billion per year which out of seven hundred fifty million wealthy people it's sixty dollars per person per year which is three uh, thirty cents out of every hundred dollars earned which yep. is fuck all yeah and that's how much we give and then he also breaks down into actually how effective it gets is worse it? <laughs> it gets worse so it's where does it go and the top 10 recipients of this money is iraq afghanistan yeah. sudan colombia and etc and iraq with all the oil down there yeah they receive 29.5 percent of the foreign aid budget Exactly. So he's saying that Iraq got 29.5% of foreign aid in 2007. Afghanistan received 6%. And the poorest 10 countries combined got 5%. Yeah. All 10 combined. Yeah. So it sounds so like there's a bit of an agenda. Yeah. <laughs> there's a bit of agenda going on <laughs> with the money. And then there's another layer on top of that. And I found this really interesting mm-hmm. as well. So when you donate um, money to a developing country, say if you're donating condoms to prevent the spread of 
um, HIV and, and things like that, all all of the donations have to come from the USA. So it might mm. a condom might cost one dollar in the developed country, so you yeah. can buy it there, and it might cost two dollars in the USA. It doesn't matter. You have yeah. to take it from the USA. So you know that's twice as yeah. or half the efficiency. Yeah, exactly. And even a, another layer on that, um, say if you're importing. Um, grain or, or agricultural products as well. Same thing. You 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 bring it from the USA, and then and then it's harder for the entrepreneurs or the the, the farmers in the developing country to produce the food and compete with all this mm. this aid because it's from the US. Exactly. And so that thirty cents per hundred dollars is getting less and less and less, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so it just absolutely cooks. But yeah, it, it ends up being nowhere near the sixty dollars per person per year. Yeah. In terms of effectiveness, it's about twenty dollars yeah. per person per year who's in extreme poverty and when you put it that way it's no wonder that it's like one it's like one meal yeah less yeah we've, so we've pretty it. much given jack shit really yeah and there's no, <laughs> no wonder there's still a lot of poverty going on in the world exactly man exactly yeah so yeah and um there's another layer just on top of that man there's something more significant than dutch disease and it's this idea of subsidies so mm. say if in africa the parts of africa cotton is, is growing there and a lot of families rely on cotton. But what the USA do in their countries, they'll subsidize the cotton industry and, and you know pour billions. So then even though in Africa they might be more productive and more sustainable, but because the USA subsidizes their own their own markets, um, mm. that, that they're actually undercutting the developing countries and developing their own cult, uh, own economy. Agreed, man. It's definitely in Oz as well that some things that are, it's better to grow things overseas and bring them here than to grow them here. Um, and it's this thing that like, you know, sometimes it's not giving aid so much as improving trade. So it yep. says trade, not aid. So if you can free up trade, that's definitely a better way to go. Yeah, so good stuff, man. And so the next chapter, unless you got any more on that, was chapter yeah. nine, and that's asking too much. So it's calculating how much you should give. Uh, I don't know where you've gone here, mate, but take it away. Take it away. Yeah. So this is the idea is, is just calculating what, you know, morally each person should actually give out of their own salary. And he's got a few ways of doing this. So the first way is he has a crack at it is calculating the amount of people in the world who are below the extreme poverty line mm -hmm. and how much it will cost to get each one of those persons above the poverty line yep. per year. And this works out to be $124 billion per person per year. So that's one way of calculating it. Yep. And that means in the annual income of the 22 richest nations um, on the planet is about $20 trillion. So this is $0.62 cents out of every $100. Yeah. Another okay. way of saying that... So essentially, it's only it's double what we've already done, but doing it properly yeah, as well. Exactly. How much is it? $0.62 cents out of every $100. Yeah. And yeah. that means if you're earning fifty grand a year, that means you only have to give about 300 bucks yeah. per year to, to end poverty, which is yeah. jack shit. That's nothing, is it? 300 bucks. Yeah. And yeah. in comparison, in 1999, America spent $116 billion on booze. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> That's funny, man. Mate, so after all of this, okay, so we've gone through the argument, setting up what is, what's happening around the world today. We've talked about some of the objections and busted those. We've talked about some of the uh, psychology and behavioral economics around why we aren't doing this. Uh, now, Singer ends off the book with Chapter 10, A Realistic Approach. And so there's a few different ways he's suggested and different people have tackled it to give different ideas. Singer lands at essentially, if you give 5% of your annual income, you're doing your share. Yep. So it's this idea of you, the amount you should give is the point at which if you were to give more, you would run a significant risk of worsening your yep. life. So 5% is very reasonable. You know? For sure. That's very, you probably won't even notice that it's coming out of, out of your paycheck. Some other things, there's a guy named James Hong who founded Hot or Not. He sold it. Gave away a lot of money. He says that you should give. He called it ten over a hundred. So everything you own over, everything you earn over a hundred k, you give ten percent of. Um, another thing called Fair Share International is they're five ten five ten. So you give five percent of your income. You reduce your environmentally harmful consumption by ten percent a year. You give five percent of your time, and you take democratic political action ten times a year. So that's another thing. And Singer finishes up. You know, five percent is a nice round one. He, he even gives like this big sliding scale based on income. Obviously. More people with more money can afford to give more. So, yeah. yeah. So I'll, go to, I'll probably go to a little bit on that as well. So this sliding scale. So obviously, if you're super, super rich, you can afford to give more. So his sliding scale is something along the same like a tax system almost. Yeah. 
But if you're on about between 100 and 150 grand, 5% is good. Above that, about 10%. And then at the very large scale, it maxes out at about you know, 33%. 33%. Like if you're earning over 10 mil a year, then 33% of everything over 10 mil. Yeah, and then we'll be able to you know, knock, um, knock world poverty out of the park, which and is the goal. And what he says is you know, getting to 5% may not be difficult, but he says you'll feel like you've done your share. And he says you might even be happier because you're taking part in this collective effort. You're trying to help some people in the poorest countries. And he said it could even give your life a bit of meaning and fulfillment. And he's got this warm glow effect of you're doing good, you're feeling good, so you're feeling better, you're doing better things, and mm. it can be um, pretty pervasive across all aspects of your life. Yeah, it sparks a point in my brain, man, about uh, the Dalai Lama. has got some really cool quote. He says, if you want to be happy, practice compassion. Mm-hmm. And if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. <laughs> nice. I like it. <laughs> I like it. Which yeah. makes a lot of sense. So if you give... You're going to be happy. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're going to be happy. Be happy. Well. Everyone's happy. Yep. So just give shit. That's and then good. Everyone's happy and <laughs> singing, singing roses and dance parkers. Nice. Mate, <laughs> finishes off with what he calls as uh, the greatest motivation. Yeah. So Henry Spira, a quote he ends with here, he says, I guess basically one wants to feel that one's life has amounted to more than just consuming products and generating garbage. I think that one likes to look back and say that they were the ones that did the best they can to make this a better place for others. What greater motivation is there doing what you can do to reduce pain and suffering in the world? Exactly, man. As you say, if we get to the end, all we've done is consume stuff and made, made trash. Mate, and, yeah, imagine, imagine yeah, living your whole life, right, yeah. and you get to 80, and then all you've amounted to, your whole impact on the world is you just consuming a whole bunch of garbage mm. and doing shit, and you haven't made the world a better place. I think that's quite a tragic thing i think yeah. and you know you'd hate to really get to the end of your life to figure that out and mm. something if you're listening to it now you know you can probably start doing good shit now and and it probably starts by giving aid it's probably the safest and easiest bet yeah, to good make a, to a good impact on the world man so not our uh, our usual sort of book but i thought it was a good read and it was actually we inter- when we interviewed dan heath a couple of months ago he said he recommended this book as the book that most changed his brain as he read it just completely shifted his views um, we're going to speak to Peter Singer. We'll probably be a bit out of our depth, but uh, he's a serious dude who hopefully will help you change even further. Yeah, mate, it's good stuff. I love this book and yeah, everyone everyone read it and donate even more importantly. Yeah. <laughs> give, give 5%. Yeah, 5%. Oh, the life that you can save It doesn't cost you much to save a life there's so many people dying in the world today There's 18 million people dying every necessarily year And that's more than the people who died in World War II More than Hitler and Stalin combined, motherfucker Peter Singer, show us how to save a life There's lots of things that we could do We could give an arsenic filter We could boil toilets We could sew up the vaginas Those obstetric fistulas the lot oh yeah. yeah don't worry about the concert next week when you go to the rock book concert give five percent of your income and you could save many lives it doesn't cost you much you won't even notice it no more bottled water no more chicken bomber on a friday no night. no just five percent you little fucker you could end World poverty, and this might end our songs. This could be the last song that we ever do. We're on the eradicate thing. poverty, eradicate the song, yeah, yeah. Give that five percent, just give that five percent. Peter Singer, you have shown us the way to save the world. We're gonna change the world now gonna together. Gonna change that world oh, and yeah. stop that poverty. And stop doing these songs Just stop it Oh yeah, yeah, yeah Just, just change the world with your 5% in your wallet You won't even know it's gone You won't even know it's gone, motherfucker, car, yeah.